what I'd like to do is do the Q&A. If I could get the PMs and the folks that spoke today from Red Hat to come up and any of the engineers that are willing to um, testify and talk. Um, we're going to let uh, Joe. Yeah, we'll turn on all the mics. I'm going to take um, two of them and ask um, one of my colleagues, and I will go up and down and answer. So um, I know this is between you and the beers. Um, but please, this is your opportunity to ask them any questions that might have come up today. Um, and there's, I can feel the stage moving with the weight of the knowledge that's here. So um, I'm going to put one down here because I know you guys talk a lot. And um, so you guys are good. And I saw that you have one and I have one. So who is our first guinea pig? All right, question? actually, before we start. I want to just give a big round of applause to all of our customer and partner presenters today. Amazing yeah. job. Wow. Yeah. And then also a huge round of applause to Diane Mueller and the team that put this event together. So, so my name is Joe Fernandes, at Joe Fern one on Twitter. If you've been following me, you know I've been live, live tweeting the event. Uh, I joke with somebody, I feel like Donald Trump at an impeachment hearing. Too soon? Too soon? <laughs> uh, I joined Red Hat eight years ago. I was the uh, product manager for OpenShift 1.0 and 2.0, and no offense to the Broadcom guys, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> but uh, with OpenShift 3, we made a huge bet on Kubernetes. Obviously, you see that we've continued that into OpenShift 4, enabling uh, all sorts of new workloads and new capabilities. Uh, with OpenShift 4, we made two new bets, right? We made a bet on... A, entirely new way to manage the platform using operators and machine controllers and uh, RHEL Core OS and all the great stuff you heard about this morning. Um, and then we also made another bet. We made a huge bet on bringing a whole new set of services to empower developers and DevOps folks, things like Istio and Knative and Tecton and all the operator backed services from our partners and so forth. Um, so we're going to continue these bets. Um, hopefully you learned a bit about that today. Uh, if you want to learn more, we'll be doing some sessions over at the conference and obviously come to openshift.com. Uh, but at this point, we just want to open it up for questions. We have uh, many of our product managers and some of the engineers and others on the stage. So uh, if you have questions, just raise your hand, grab a mic, and we will uh, get it to the right person. OK. Uh, for Jeremy Ader, um, I was, ah, there you go. Hi. There is. <laughs> I enjoyed your talk. Uh, big fan of operators. Um, I was paying particular attention to the part where you're telling me about the API for creating um, clusters. Uh, you showed us the CLI, actually, not the API. But I assume it looks like a traditional RPC-oriented API. You can use curl instead of the command line tool. <laughs> but yeah, OK. We so can use curl to interact with Red Hat. It seems to me you have snatched defeat from the jaws of victory. Um, why does the client not simply uh, use uh, a kubectl or whatever to create a, a Kubernetes API object to define what he wants. In some some people have thought along those lines, including a, a kubectl plugin, but there's nothing productized at this point. So we, it, it may be possible, but it's just not just yet. Thank you. Yeah. For using OpenShift Container Platform in a public cloud. Is there anything coming down the wire that would allow me to light, like run, the, install, and manage the cluster myself, yet pay for it by the hour, as opposed to having? I think in my talks with Red with Red Hat for licensing, I had to pay for my peak for the entire year. So you want to install and manage OpenShift clusters yourself, but pay for it by the hour on yeah. any of the public clouds? Right. Yeah, be easier I, I think, to sell so like a consumption-based. Yeah, so we we have uh, done work around sort of an hourly or consumption-based uh, pricing model that could enable that. Um, we don't have that today. Uh, a lot of what we needed to do was uh, sort of enable some of the metering that would allow you to to actually uh, do that more effectively with the metering operator that you saw. I think came out in four two. That provides some of the underpinnings of that. But um, I, I think it's an I think it's an interesting model. Um, also, OpenShift four. A lot of what we did with sort of bootstrapping clusters and, and really tying into the different cloud provider uh, infrastructures and inter interfaces is to make that whole process of bootstrapping and self-managing or you know make the platform more self-managing is key. But um, we should probably talk later about uh, a little bit more about kind of exactly what you're looking for. So nothing 
like right away, but yeah. certainly something that we're thinking about. And the only thing I would add, and so I mentioned, we, we need to get the technology in place. And starting in December, there's a new SaaS service that will be up at cloud.redhat.com called Cost Management. And you'll be able to see more visibility of the cost of your cluster. Once we have that in place, we can turn on the back end, which is our procurement process, and that's a whole other ball of yarn. A um, question around the service mesh and STO product set. Uh, when Steve Dake was talking about you know, extending STO into the VM space, uh, is that part of the product supported roadmap as opposed to the upstream STO? Uh, or is the STO service mesh uh, delivered through OpenShift constrained to Kubernetes? So um, I guess I was looking for Brian, he's not here. So, uh, so the question was uh, whether we're planning to support service mesh and Istio outside of a container-based environment. Um, right now, we don't have plans for that, right? So, um, so uh, OpenShift service mesh, which is generally available now, by the way, go out and, and you can use it with uh, OpenShift 4.2. Um, right now, it's included as a service with OpenShift, uh, so we don't actually uh, sell it separately. Uh, we also don't uh, support it today outside of a Kubernetes-based environment uh, through OpenShift. Um, there are some interesting use cases, obviously, for uh, service mesh uh, with virtual machine-based environments and, and other non-Kubernetes environments. Um, it's not in our product plans to offer that as supported today, but it's, it's something that we do contribute to through the work uh, being done up upstream that Steven and Brian uh, talked about uh, earlier today. So. All right, there, oh, I, you know, I walk over here. There, go ahead, go for there. Uh, there's a lot of interest on KubeVert. Uh, what's your position on that? We got our KubeVert guy. <laughs> uh, our position on KubeVert is in OpenShift 4 on the documentation links. You'll see down the bottom container native virtualization, which is our productized variant of KubeVert. Um, KubeVert, for those who don't know, allows me to uh, deploy, manage, and run virtual machines on an OpenShift cluster, uh, particularly a bare metal OpenShift cluster. Um, it is in technology preview still right now, uh, but certainly on 4.2, you can go out and try it today. And we'd encourage people to do that. And uh, on Twitter, I'm at XS Gordon. Would love to hear feedback. Yeah, one of the projects that I'm really excited about the most, KubeVert, um, again, uh, you know, a lot of people who run OpenShift and Kubernetes today run it in a vert environment. Obviously, what you heard this morning and some talks this afternoon is OpenShift runs great on bare metal. Uh, I think it's the best way to run Kubernetes. Uh, but when you run on bare metal, uh, what do you do with the workloads that still run in VMs? Well, you bring those VMs to Kubernetes instead of bringing Kubernetes uh, to VMs. And so that's the idea behind KubeVert, running a mix of uh, container and VM-based workloads, all managed with a Kubernetes control plane on a, on a shared platform. It's very cool. It's in developer preview right now. It's called uh, OpenShift uh, Container Native Virtualization. So hopefully everybody uh, here who's interested can go and try that out. Uh, right here. So with the announcement of uh, OKD4 um, in terms of um, feature set, I guess when in, you, you, know, you guys go to release a GA, what's the target, um, I guess, when you compare it to enterprise or OCP in terms of the, the features? So, um, so OpenShift, everything in OpenShift has, um, OpenShift 4 has been open source the whole time. Our current thought is um, pretty much everything that would be in OCP is um, in the core platform would be part of OKD. There's a few components that don't run on anything except RHEL Core OS right now. Um, some of the work around the bare metal stuff, um, those are all roadmap items to go make sure that those work well with um, the metal cube upstream, but it'll take us some time. Um, there's a number of uh, operators above where the community versions should work on top. We haven't quite gotten to that point yet. I think the focus for the next two, three months is gonna be stabilizing, making sure we have a good repeatable dev cycle, making sure that folks in the community who wanna uh, contribute are able to do so. And then I suspect you know, we'll start, um, as we get into early next, uh, early next year, there'll be some uh, bigger discussions in the community. We have a roadmap that was set out um, in August or so where we're trying to break this down into chunks and make sure that we have a good repeatable dev uh, workflow. But and there's, no re there's no belief, I think, that we have that we withhold um, anything or change it. It would just be, uh, are those components well integrated with OKD or not? And that's up to those upstream communities. Yeah, I think some, some people think of, well, isn't OKD the upstream for, for OpenShift? 
I mean, the upstream for OpenShift is ultimately Kubernetes, much like the upstream for RHEL is Linux itself, right? And so all, we do all of our work in Kubernetes uh, first and then uh, build stuff around that uh, to manage the clusters. Uh, but OKD uh, is important for many of our community members. It's sort of that sort of uh, pre-commercial distribution of, of OpenShift. We had some work to do mainly on the Linux side, we always blame the Linux guys, uh, but to get a, a, a non-commercial version of RHEL CoreOS, which is uh, Fedora CoreOS that, um, that OKD is based on, it's out there today, and as, as it was in 3X, it will sort of uh, iterate and also be the place where we try out some new things uh, you know, before it comes into sort of a beta or dev preview uh, in, the, uh, in the commercial offering. Yeah, and I'll note that, um, especially on the Fedora CoreOS side, Fedora CoreOS is driven by the Fedora community, and it's um, much more accelerated uh, than RHEL CoreOS is. RHEL CoreOS is actually co-designed and co-developed to be on the exact OCP life cycles. Um, we're just starting to go through the discussion of what that'll look like. Um, in the Fedora community and with OKD, um, but I would expect it to move um, in some areas uh, more quickly, and that may mean that you know that changes how we release OKD um, based on things like C groups v2, which is now in Fedora 31 or Fedora 30. I don't know which Fedora we're on. I can't tell. Um, and so that sort of um, progression, um, OKD will probably go through periods where we take on. Uh, things in the upstream communities that aren't fully baked yet because they're so um, such large changes uh, and uh, We haven't yet hit that first one, but it'll probably be the C groups work Hi uh, Can can yeah, just a quick one um, When can we see the support for CSI snapshot? driver say it again the CSI snapshot driver CSI support. snapshot yeah. <laughs> so we're hoping to bring CSI snapshot in the 4.4 release, which would be the March-April time frame. All right. Yeah, thanks. So CSI, um, Kubernetes is going through this project of taking the entry storage providers and bring them out to a containerized storage interface implementation. So a lot of the work is taking the existing entry devices like iSCSI, Fiber Channel, all the Elastic Block, Google Compute, all those storage that we support in Kubernetes and re-instrumenting them out on the CSI interface. And a lot of the ISV vendors here are also ported to the uh, CSI interface as well. Yeah, and uh, we will have the dev preview available with 4.3. So if you want to just play around with see the APIs, you can do that. Yeah, so that's um, OpenShift container storage 4.3. Uh, yeah. Sorry? 4.3, right? OpenShift um, OCP 4.3? I do have the dev preview of the snapshot and um, clone and restore APIs. CSI. And that should, like, so the nightlies of 4.3 are already out there. Um, I actually think the basic enablement is in. Um, so you can try a 4.3 nightly, and you should be able to access that. Yeah, th this is actually something I wanted to mention to everybody, right? So one of the cool new things we introduced with OpenShift 4x is the availability of something called OpenShift nightlies, right? So OpenShift nightlies, once we start publishing them, are essentially early uh, views at the next release, right? So right now, OpenShift 4.2 is generally available to everybody. It's fully supported by Red Hat. Uh, but I, th I think we, we already began publishing or, or the uh, OpenShift 4.3 nightlies. So if you ever want to like, look ahead to the next release, some of the things we're working on, or if there's some features that you were you know, hoping to test out, uh, try out those nightlies. Um, and then OpenShift 4.3 general availability will come uh, uh, looking like early January. And this is actually, um, so I'm going to, uh, this is actually a really important point for us. So um, uh, as part of the health monitoring program, um, folks, um, when they opt in to that service, you're actually sending back the versions. Um, I've actually seen that quite a few people try out nightlies. Uh, ahead of the GA version. Um, we can actually do more to make that communication clearer if you'd like. You know, that sort of feedback's really important to us. So um, right now the 4.3 nightly is in a reasonable feature complete state. And so if there's something that you're excited about in OpenShift 4.3, that should be available now in the nightlies. And if you try it out in your environments and you hit issues, um, both reporting it as bugs or if they cause stability issues with the new configurations that might be there. So if you turn on CSI drivers, and causes your test cluster to crash. Um, that's actually feedback that um, will come back through the health monitoring service, and that helps us um, prepare for the release because there's a lot of um, variety in uh, customer and um, test configurations that we don't always have the exact um, info about how you'd like to use that. And so participating in the nightlies 
and opting in to the health data monitoring and sending us um, that usage data is actually incredibly valuable for us to support you better. And it's all exciting. <laughs> Hi. Uh, just a quick question. I think there was a great discussion earlier this morning around digital transformation and how it's not just a technology problem. And after all, all these platforms that we are talking about from infrastructure standpoint is, is leading to business delivery, right? If there is no business delivery, there is no you know, meaning for, the, for these platforms. So is there any strategy around application development? I think we are accelerating the infrastructure cycle, but application development takes most of the time when it comes to business delivery. What are your thoughts from digital transformation standpoint and accelerating that cycle? I guess some of the work that we're doing with Knative, Service Mesh, Tectone, it's all really addressing some of the problems that you're talking about. Right? It's really bringing some of this uh, uh, life cycle for application development to uh, a place, to a state where it's really easy to do on top of Kubernetes, which traditionally has been challenging for an average developer to get started, right? This is something that, again, it's already embedded in the platform. So things like the developer console that we ship now with 4.2 and we continue to enhance in 4.3, they add to that so that you can start building applications using the console. You can deploy the application straight from the console without that much knowledge about the platform. Things like code-ready workspaces so that the IDE is integrated to the API on Kubernetes side so you can deploy from there and you can run the IDE in the browser already. Some of those things already, I'd say, addresses some of the challenges that you're having. I mean, is there a way to bring a business uh, person to the conversation is what my question is about. Yeah. You know, that's, that's really the key because ultimately business is going to pay for this. Yeah, we asked a question just one, one more time. You want to know how digital transformation uh, hooks into business lines? Is that uh, I think the, uh, the more important point is from business standpoint, enterprise application development takes most of the cycle, if you will. Infrastructure is, yes, it's a foundational block. But I can accelerate 10% or 20% of this, but business delivery is really dependent on the enterprise application releases. So what is that we are talking about? I'm not just talking about the developer focus. I'm more talking about from business focus standpoint. What is that? Is there any strategy to bring that into a conversation from OpenShift standpoint? Yeah, I mean, I think I mean, those are conversations that, that we seek to have uh, with, with all our customers. Uh, I think uh, when you come to conferences like this, uh, you know, OpenShift Commons gatherings or Summit, and you hear customer talks, you know, sure, they'll talk about OpenShift and some features and capabilities uh, that they're excited about, but you know, you know, more than ever, what they talk about is you know, the challenges of getting this working in their environment and showing business value to their customers. I think the, uh, the Exxon Mobile team did an excellent job showing how, um, how they're providing real business value by accelerating uh, or enabling the collaboration between their data scientists and accelerating their ability to, to do machine learning and data science uh, on the platform. So it's not ultimately about the platform or even the developers who are building it. It's about the value that those things combined uh, provide to the business. And um, can we do a better job of bringing it into the conversation? We're, we're sure trying, and that's why we, we're bringing uh, folks like Jabe and, and, uh, and the panel this morning uh, uh, to Red Hat to, to, to drive those non-product conversations, because ultimately, you know, based on just what customers are talking about, that's the, that's the biggest challenge is the people, the process, the cultural challenges. You know, I so I have some comments, actually. The, I would say, starting with the, I question some of the assertions that you made about how it's really about development, because if you look at what the cost is of managing most of your portfolio, the, the cost of operations is dwarfing the cost of development in all cases, because if it's not free to run things, then you just run the clock, it's eventually going to cost more. Right? That's, the, that's the nature of a service. So unless you're shipping things cut on CDs, if you have to actually keep servers running, which is basically what we're building for you, then, then that, that cost will eventually dwarf it. The other thing I'd say, that this goes back to something that, that Clayton said on stage earlier, that we're essentially in some ways, we're, we're part of your SRE with the emphasis on the E. Right? So you're gonna have to bring people to fill in the other parts of that, but we're building this platform together with our customers so that they can provide this reliable underpinning. And I'd say nothing transforms the development possibilities for your organization more than in improving your operations. Yeah, I think Andrew, I, just to clarify my question, I did not stress on the cost specifically. 
because op I completely agree with you, operations cost is much more than the development cost. It's the speed to market that I was talking about from business standpoint. All right. So, great so, question. Let's let's. Uh, so, so yeah. just just one last thought. They're like I agree, but the the way to reduce the speed to market is make doing the right thing the easy thing, so that you have these guardrails that allow your developers to make the right de de decisions on the business, the domain that they're working on, instead of trying to configure all the random things for their platform. And so, and I'm gonna add that te DevOps is 10 years old this year, right? And, and you know, we use this in bad ways and good ways, but the point is there's some things we've learned. And that some things about sort of DevOps metrics, flow, and so I think part of the, what the panel you saw this morning, this team, is to try to figure out what is the next 10 years of DevOps look like? Like we, we've got all the patterns now, the books, the presentations. And so what, what have we learned? What do we do right? What do we do wrong? And I think you know, that leads us into sort of, the, you know, I, like ideation is a big part. Like, like we, we're really good in DevOps of commit to production. Like we nailed that. 10 years, we got that down. You know, other thing, and I'm not saying we're going to do this definitely, but that's part of what Jay, myself, Kevin, and Andrew are about is to try to figure out like what happened in DevOps in the, in the last 10 years. What does it look like in the next 10 years? So, wonderful program today, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very, very much. Scott Fulton with ZDNet. I sat in on a webinar uh, a couple of months back that had to do with uh, service mesh. It was not a Red Hat webinar. But there were several implementers in there. And one of the things they, they all agreed upon, and I thought was interesting, is they were implementing service mesh to the point where they all said, and they agreed on this, that they foresaw a time when for the purposes of service discovery, they would no longer have to use DNS, that they could completely rely on their service mesh to deliver service discovery. I'm wondering if you folks think that that is a rational goal for service mesh, or whether you think there may be some danger in that. So I think anybody who tells you that you're never going to need anything that you currently use now and that you're going to be able to get rid of it is lying to you. Um, <laughs> and so one of the things that I would say is um, I think the within a cluster, I can actually envision a lot of that sort of stuff. I mean, there's been a couple of talks even at KubeCon, though, of adding more service mesh, cap uh, some of the capabilities at a lower level in Kubernetes that exist in Istio today. Um, because Kubernetes wasn't designed as a, we're going to build the basic primitives and then let, let everybody else solve the problems, but we want to work with the communities and find patterns that are generally applicable. I think the argument I would make would be that uh, the DNS system, or the domain name system, um, the DNS is always so awkward to say, the DNS is so broadly applicable to so many environments that I question anyone who believes that it will go away. Um, certainly, Service Mesh provides a ton of advantages when you think of it as an application interfacing layer. And you know, if there's one trend I think that we've seen is moving more and more of the things, that, like we still talked about guardrails. Service Mesh is a great guardrail because it allows you to use patterns and primitives that take common problems and make them the responsibility of a mature operations team um, versus being things that you expect every developer to understand the details of. I would say I, I, I could certainly see uh, service meshes growing, being stitched into many pieces, but I think you know, we'll continue to have lots of points of integration, and that choice of how much or how little you use, I think will continue. Um, uh, quick question about Quay. Can you describe the difference between Quay versus Harbor? Testing, one, two, three. Uh, the question was, can I describe the differences between Quay and Harbor? Uh, the number one difference right now is that Quay is a live service that serves over a billion images right now, has over a million repositories, and serves hundreds of thousands of requests a minute, and we know it works. Quay.io is one of the largest, depends on the day, it's either the largest or second largest. It kind of fluctuates with GCR, if I recall, um, but largest registries on the planet, which means that when we make code changes, we test them at scale first, on Quay.io, and then subsequently we release them in Red Hat Quay. Now, since uh, the community version of Quay will have code being merged in constantly, if you're running the community version and you're not running a particular release, you'll also be testing it along with us, but if you're running Red Hat Quay, you have the benefit of that experience of running 
a registry at scale that pretty much no one else with the exception of the major cloud providers, Google, Amazon, et cetera, have. And we know for a fact, as, as someone who is constantly on call for Quayo, I can tell you, we know it works. Um, otherwise, it wouldn't sleep at all. And um, that's a huge benefit. On top of that, um, Quay is also the only registry product on the market. And I mentioned this earlier, but we're the only registry product on the market that um, has a guarantee of backwards compatibility. So we, to this day, still support Docker uh, API version 1. So if you took a doc Docker client, uh, Docker 0. Docker 0. 0.4, which you know came out in, what, 2013, and you were to try to push an image against a version of Quay with the right feature flag enabled right now, it would work. And then you could pull that image with the most modern version of Podman, and it would just work seamlessly. And that's part of our commitment to the enterprise space that no other registry product is really committed to. Um, whether or not they see the difficulty in doing so, I don't know. Um, beyond that, we just, we have, we've just demonstrated a consistent um, ability to innovate. So Claire was the first, we were the first, of course, private Docker registry available. We were the first one with security scanning. Claire is built by our team, so our integration is extremely um, efficient, as will the new integration with the new version of Claire that's coming along. Um, I don't want to speak ill of others, um, but some integrations have been less than well done, in my experience. Um, and um, moving forward, this will be this level of innovation will continue on Quay because we're continuing to be kind of a pioneer when it comes to the container registry space. Um, I know that's a very high level description. Um, there's a lot of little subtle things too, like our feature list wise, we're, we're kind of ahead of the curve in quite a few areas. Sorting for squashed images, automated builds, which we had first. Um, uh, we have our upcoming uh, roadmap, which I spoke a little bit about. There's a, there's a lot of stuff there and a lot of really cool stuff coming down the pipeline, um, like the um, uh, container security operator, which is coming into OpenShift in, in, with Quay 3.2 next month. Um, so. That's, that's a, it's a big list, but a lot of different yeah. areas, yeah. It's, it's also important to note, like, you can use whatever registry you want with OpenShift. So if you want to use Harbor, if you want to use Docker Trusted Registry, some people pick Artifactory or, or uh, Nexus because they're managing other types of artifacts. We focus on containers. But if you want the best, most scalable, uh, most feature-rich registry on the planet for containers, that's Quay. That's Red Hat Quay, so, uh, so check it out. The boat is not going to explode. So. Yeah, I promise the boat won't explode. Hi, thank you. I'm like, uh, one of the couple of things that I've been playing around is around KNV or KNA, or what's the uh, cube word, I guess. Uh, two questions around that. So what's an ETA around KNV, I think, which is what uh, the commercial version of cube word is. And the other one is about uh, Windows support. Okay. About Windows so, container? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Windows containers. All right. So, so, uh, so the question was, uh, when will Knative and Windows? Uh, uh, the can it's Kubevert. Uh, Kubevert. Oh, Kubevert. Okay. Commercial yeah. availability of Kubevert. Um, so Kubevert currently is technology preview. Uh, we're not currently forecasting a GA for that. Uh, we are trying to build that roadmap based on customer feedback. Um, so what we're looking for really is trying to establish uh, what is the right level of feature functionality um, that we need to reach um, to support the customer workloads that people want to bring onto the platform. Uh, in the recent release, we did add uh, live migration, which will work with the upcoming release of OpenShift Container Storage. Uh, so we do have some of those traditional enterprise virtualization features in the platform. Um, there's others that were touched on earlier, like snapshots, clones, that we'd like to bring in as well. Um, but really, again, I can only just encourage people to try the tech preview. We'd love to get feedback. We'd love to have conversation about what features you would like to see in that um, for us to make that graduation to general availability. Mike, want to talk about Windows containers? Was the next one about Windows containers? Yeah. Oh, yes. Windows containers. I love Windows <laughs> containers. So Windows containers um, is on a trajectory probably around the 4.4, like the CSI, um, to go GA on us. Uh, we're hoping this week, the end of this week, beginning of next week, we'll reamp our dev preview program where Windows containers will run on the 4.x platform. Right now, we have them running on the 3.x platform. Um, and that'll simplify people's usage and allow more people to try it out more rapidly. Yeah, and I'll, I'd say this is one of the most common questions we get as product managers is when is X, Y, or Z going to become generally available? I mean, I think, I think everybody knows this, but 
that's a big deal for us, right? When we say something's generally available, we're saying you can run it in your mission critical production systems. We will support it, not just now, but for the next several years. We'll patch it, maintain it. Um, in the case of Kubevert, uh, there's some maturity that we still need to see. Uh, VM workloads are hard, right? Uh, and you know, we're looking for you guys to tell us at which point do, we, do, you, do you feel like it's, it's to the point where it's going to provide you value in production environments, uh, even if it's not doing everything that a vSphere would do or whatever. Um, same thing with Windows containers. Frankly, um, you know, the, the, the maturity of the Windows OS container itself is still something that's, you know, I think maturing. Uh, and, then, um, and then certainly we still have work to do in the Windows Kubernetes uh, SIG uh, to, uh, to make ourselves comfortable that it's something that we're going to say, yes, this is ready for full-on uh, production use. Uh, we do expect them both to be generally available in the upcoming year. Uh, in the upcoming calendar year. Uh, we'll have uh, a better read on that as we get more feedback uh, from folks who are trying out our, our early access previews, and, um, and we'll have, uh, stay tuned for more on that. So. All right, did we get all the questions, Diane? All right, or people just want beer. <laughs> all right, well, thank you everybody for coming and spending the day with us. Uh,